I'm delighted to uh, have you all here today for our uh, Michael Baptista lecture. Um, the Michael Baptista lecture uh, is named in honor of the late Michael Baptista, uh, who was a Guyanese-born executive vice president of the Royal Bank um, and a York alumnus. Um, he received an MBA from the Schulich School of Business. Um, and he, uh, his family and friends uh, endowed this prize and lecture series uh, to honor his uh, spirit and success, his, um, the importance to him of his Guyanese and Caribbean roots, and his outstanding achievements uh, at the Royal Bank, um, and especially his drive and love of learning. And uh, Sirlac is immensely honored to be the recipient of this endowment and to be able to put on the Baptista Lecture, which you're present at here today. Um, and uh, as well as the Baptista uh, essay prizes, which we will also be presenting here today. So um, before we begin, I would like to thank Sharon Baptista, who is Michael Baptista's widow, for her enormous contributions to Sir Lack and to the Baptista Prize over the years. Um, we, we, I was telling uh, Sharon that it's actually quite unusual at York to have uh, such a well-funded prize for uh, student work. And so we, we really feel honored to be able to, to distribute this prize. And um, Sharon's support has been really important to Sirlac over the years. The first Baptista lecture was delivered in 1999 by Oscar Arias, who was the former president of Costa Rica. Um, and in general, uh, the uh, lecture seeks to, seeks to bring prominent speakers from the Latin American and Caribbean region, although Greg is an exception to this rule, um, here to York. So once again, thank you. Um, I would like to take this occasion to present the Baptista Prize as well. The Baptista Prize uh, gives $500 to an undergraduate essay and a graduate essay on uh, subjects related to Latin America and the Caribbean, or the diasporas, uh, Latin American and Caribbean diasporas. Um, and it seeks to recognize academic excellence in essays that promote greater understanding of the culture and political economy of the regions. Um, we have actually three winners this year, which is uh, great, because we had, uh, our, in our graduate uh, prize, our graduate competition, we had such excellent essays that we couldn't decide amongst the two finalists. So we have two graduate finalists this year. Um, I am going to just, before we begin, ha is Nabila here? Or Terine? Okay, great, good. Um, we have two of our three recipients here today. So let me first, uh, Nabila Islam, who is our undergraduate winner, is not here, but I'll tell you a bit about her paper. Her paper was called Subject Making and Resistance in the Amazon, 16th to 20th Century. Um, and the adjudicators noted of her paper that Nabila Islam's essay explores historical representations of the Amazon and its peoples from European and indigenous perspectives. Islam carefully dissects terms and characterizations in both narratives in order to demonstrate how they were connected to and representative of divergent experiences and subjectivities produced through the colonial encounter. Um, and they describe the essay as well organized, beautifully written, and tightly argued. It could easily be published in a professional journal. So in Nabila's absence, I'd like to <laughs> applaud her. Um, and I'll invite Sharon up to the stage to present the two graduate winners with their prizes. So the first of our graduate, uh, graduate prize winners is Priya Chenke um, from the anthropology department, I'm pleased to say as an anthropologist. Um, and we'd like to bring Priya up to the stage. Where are you, Priya? There you are. Um, <laughs> Priya won the prize for her paper, uh, which was called My Peruvian Museum. Uh, the adjudicators described it as a very rich, well-researched post-colonial and post-modern approach to reframing history and its representation, challenging the great men and great battles view of history, not only by identifying, but also by unpacking aspects of history and daily life that are often hidden and counter-hegemonic. Another adjudicator noted that it is, impress it is impressive how even in brief entries, Chenki traces the shifts in meaning and use of objects and events and symbols with attention to nuance, contradiction, and multiple meanings. So congratulations, Priya. 
And Tareen, I'd like to invite you up to the stage as well. Tareen Friday has won the award for her paper on copyright economy, protecting works of mass in Trinidad and Tobago's culture industry. Um, the adjudicators noted that the paper brings cultural studies scholarship into critical conversation with legal discourses about copyright protection, which makes the analysis highly original and insightful. Uh, additionally, the paper makes a compelling argument for decolonizing the region's copyright economy, an argument that has significant implications for understanding the intersection of cultural production and legal protection in the region. So, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Sarah, for presenting the news. Um, we're very proud, um, and very proud of our students, and very proud of the sort of richness of scholarship um, from the undergraduate level and up that the prize allows us to recognize uh, in this forum. So, thank you again. Uh, now, let's move on to the lecture, the Baptista lecture. We are truly honored to welcome Greg Grandin for our Baptista lecture today. His lecture is entitled, Who Ain't a Slave? Um, and I'm forgetting the, this subtitle this year. Uh, Slavery and Freedom, and something like that. <laughs> Greg Grandin is an extraordinarily accomplished scholar with a number of books to his name, as well as edited books, essays, volumes, uh, and fellowships, and other honors. Too numerous to list here. Um, when I first met Greg, which is now a very, very long time ago, he was working on his first book, The Blood of Guatemala, which brought a powerful new voice into scholarship on Guatemalan history, which is too often ignored that indigenous Guatemalans have histories as well as cultures, and that those histories are linked to broader processes in the Americas as a whole. Um, since then, over a succession of books that many of you will have known or read and read, The Last Colonial Massacre, Empire's Workshop, Fordlandia, and now The Empire of Necessity, Greg has gifted us both with beautifully crafted and lovingly evoked stories of how different denizens of the Americas have negotiated these broader processes in lives of what I think of as subaltern heroism, um, and as well as with a sustained critique of American empire and American exceptionalism which he insists has taken its form and counterpoint to these lives um, and the other ways of inhabiting the world that they represent. Um, his glowing reviews for all of his books and his nomination for prizes like the National Book Award and the Pulitzer suggest that this message has been heard, despite what you were saying earlier. Um, but Greg is also a public intellectual, and I think this is what brings him, uh, this is what unites him to other people we've had for the Baptista lectures in the past. Um, and I hesitate to invoke this term lightly. It's, a, it's often invoked and not often necessarily uh, uh, rightly, but in Greg's case, I think it is. Um, his critical commentary for media ranging from Democracy Now! to the New York Times, that's quite a broad span, on US relations with Latin America and on the need to consider Latin American realities outside US agendas for these realities, have made him a widely heated voice of the American left. Um, and for both his scholarship and his, uh, his public scholarship, his public intellectual scholarship, I am delighted and honored to welcome here today to tell us more about his latest project. Thank you. Um, thank, should, do I talk into this? I, I don't know if I need to, right? I have, I have, is this a microphone or is it just a recorder? So I don't really need this, right? Okay. It's, uh, it's, it's quite intimidating to be up here. You can't really see anything. Um, this, I want to thank Carlota for inviting me. And I mean, I know, I know the lecture series. I usually invite people from Latin America, but I like to, I, I don't really think of, um, I might not be an exception, because I like to think of Brooklyn as part of the greater, greater Latin American and Caribbean world. <laughs> Uh, it's really wonderful to be here and to see old friends and, and, and friends like Leo and Sam and, 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 to, and, to, and to be able to, to come here and talk about um, my new book. And, and that's, what, that's what the topic of the lecture is going to be. The, this book which just came out a few, a, few, um, a few months ago, The Empire of Necessity. And it's based on, um, its takeoff point is, is uh, this incredible short novella that Herman Melville wrote in, in 1855. Uh, called Benito Sereno, 
and uh, it's, it's nominally set in, 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 on a slave ship in the South Pacific, but the story really takes place in, um, in the mind of the master class. And, uh, and not the, the slave-owning master class, because it, the main character that events turn around, Amasa Delano, uh, wasn't a slave owner. He, he thought of himself as a modern man. He was from New England, and he thought of himself as part of this kind of new world being born. It was a cheerful modernist. And uh, it really is a remarkable, remarkable novel. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's unique in form. Uh, it, people know Melville from Moby Dick, which is this sprawling, sprawling story that takes place over multiple oceans and involves crews of all races, men of all races. Um, uh, Benito Sereno really takes place in one day aboard one ship, and, and not even that, even more compressed and claustrophobic, it all is told through the world view of Amasa Delano, the, the main character. I wouldn't quite call him a protagonist because I think protagonists have to have some sense or some knowledge or awareness of the, of the world around them, the social world around them, however biased and informed and mediated through their own interests and experiences. But Amasa Delano had no, had no clue uh, the story unfolds with him uh, in the South Pacific on a sealing expedition, and, uh, and, and early one morning he sees his men spot uh, another ship, a distressed Spanish slave ship. Um, it was eerily looking. It was eerily looking. Melville describes it as almost not coming from around an island in which Delano's ship was, but almost from the depths of the ocean. It was it was mantled in in. Uh, and it was trailing sea grasses, uh, grass, and its its uh, its deck was calcified. Its hull was calcified. Its uh, uh, sails were tattered and worn. And uh, Amasa Delano boards the ship, and he events conspire that he spends all day on board the ship by himself. He sends his men back to the, the island in order to fill the ship's water uh, casks with water and to fetch food. And he becomes increasingly obsessed with. Um, the dozens of West African slaves, people he thinks are slaves on board the ship, and the relationship between the man who introduced himself as, 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 um, as the ship's captain, Benito Sereno, and, his rela and, and Sereno's relationship with his black body servant, his own personal slave, Babo. And um, about two, uh, two thirds into the story, it's revealed um, that, uh, that the, the men that, that, that Delano thought were slaves weren't slaves. They had, they had been enslaved, but months, weeks earlier, they had risen up, seized the ship, um, and, and slaughtered most of the Spaniards, including the man taking them, the slave traders taking them to Lima to be sold in, in, in Lima's slave market, and demanded to be returned to Senegal, to West Africa. And then when they, this is all revealed at the end of the story, um, and, and, and one of the wonderful things about this kind of, this very claustrophobic novel is that readers, I mean, readers don't have any idea what's coming. Melville is really quite um, a magician in some ways in, in, his, in his prose and in, in keeping this revealed. Um, uh, uh, but, when they, but then it's told in a series of flashbacks that when they ran into Delano's ship, they had two choices. They could have fled or they could have fought, but instead they came up with this plan that they would pretend to still be slaves. And, um, and what's wonderful about the story, again, is this feeling of claustrophobia, this feeling of, 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 um, of being closed in, of not really knowing what is going on and knowing that there's something strange on board the ship but not being able to identify it, that Melville is able to recreate this worldview of this New England mariner. And, um, and the story, which wasn't like many of Melville's stories after Moby Dick, wasn't widely read, but it was written at a very, very, very um, consequential moment in both the author's life and the life of the nation. It was 1855, was a few years after the commercial and critical failure of Moby Dick. Nobody read that novel, and those who did thought it was an indication that Melville had lost his mind or, or was, had grown increasingly irrelevant, and a few years before the Civil War. Um, uh, so you, it could be read as a, as, a, as, a, as a metaphor for the author's own claustrophobia. Because by that point, he had locked himself into his Berkshire uh, farmhouse and, and, and shut himself off from most of the world. And Melville biographers talk about how it, right after that, the story was published, Melville has an emotional, physical breakdown. Or a metaphor for, for antebellum America that's too blind to see what's in front of, uh, of, um, of, of its own eyes. This 
looming crisis, the looming civil war that Melville somehow managed to take the pulse and capture that feeling, that feeling of, of, of existential impasse for the American Republic. Um, it really is just this, um, this wonderful, wonderful story. And so a few years ago, maybe six or seven years ago, I, I had assigned it a couple of times um, in a class that I had taught on, on Latin American US relations. And I had assigned it as, an, as a piece of literature, as it captured something about Anglo attitudes, the black legend of Spanish America, and, and mediated through slavery. And it was just a, it was just a fun novel to teach, it's just, a, just over 100 pages. And um, I remember, preparing one day for class and I was reading up on secondary literature and, and I, I saw, I found up in, in a footnote of, of a literary scholar that, um, that it was a true story, that it was all, that, it, that, that Melville basically got the story and pretty much retranscribed it in, in, in very faithful terms from, from a chapter of, of a real person named Amasa Delano, um, who was a New England sea captain born in Duxbury, Massachusetts. And, um, and, uh, and I remember staring at that footnote and it was kind of like, it was kind of like being told that Ridley Scott's Alien was a true story. Because, because it, you know, it's, it's kind of the same structure of the story. There's, you know there's evil on board, you know there's evil lurking on the ship, but you don't know who or where it is. And then about two thirds into the story, it explodes in this very explosive, in this very dramatic scene, the truth is revealed, which I'll get into a little bit later. And I remember staring at that for a while and, 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 and trying to make sense of it because um, how could this be? I mean, not only was, not only is, is, uh, is um, you know, it, 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 how could these West Africans have, have pulled off this, this, this day-long deception on this new in, experienced New England, uh, New England mariner, who turns out was an ancestor of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, and I started researching it, and I started reading the, you know, I read the, 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 the memoir, Amasa Delano's memoir, which was published about 40 years before Melville wrote his story, a little bit less than 40 years, in, in, in 1817. And, um, you know, Melville was famously opaque. Biographers complain that one doesn't really get a sense of what it was that was motivating him. Like, he didn't leave a whole lot of letters or diary entries into into the writing process, and that's especially so for Benito Sereno, for the story. There's no, no explanation of what it was that, that, that compelled him to, to, to write about the story, but if one reads the historical memoir, if one reads the, um, the, 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 the real event as, as it was described in chapter 18 of Delano's memoir, one could get a sense of what it was that, that attracted Melville to the story. Um, as Delano describes events that day, um, they, um, which took place in March in 1804, um, events kind of have a triangular symmetry of a play, you know, Delano, Benito Sereno, and it wasn't, and the name was anglicized a little bit, the real Spanish captain's name was Benito Sereno with an N-Y and, and two R's, double R. Um, and, and the black body, the, the black rebel turned actor pretending to be a slave, Maury. So it has this kind of triangular symmetry, and it also has the, the psychological and historical depth of a Greek play, a Greek tragedy or a Greek epic. Um, Homer's Odyssey, for instance, and made me think of Homer's Odyssey, is not about slavery, but it tells of a character, Odysseus, who, um, who many scholars think represents the first modern self because he's able to use cunning, he's able to use his reason and, 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 and to, to drive a wedge between his interior life and his interior thoughts and surface reality. And, and he's able to use his cunning in order to gull the Cyclops and, and, and escape from the Cyclops, for instance. You know, I, I am nobody, Odysseus says, you know, and, and playing with the subtleties of language in order to escape from that, that particular predicament. And that's in some ways exactly what, what these West Africans do, particularly the leaders of this revolt and deception is that, um, is that they do to escape Delano. They act as if they were inconsequential slaves. Uh, nobody's hardly worth noticing. Um, and it's that, that playing around between the kind of in, interior discipline needed to pull off this deception and, and, and being able to manipulate reality, which I think in some ways gets at the heart of, of slavery's primal deception. Um, you know, aside from its sheer audacity, 
um, I think what's most fascinating about the story is, is how it exposes this larger falsehood, right, that, on which the whole ideological apparatus of slavery, ideological institution of slavery rested. The idea that um, slaves were loyal and simple-minded, people with no independent lives or thoughts. Though if they did have an inner life, that that too was the jurisdiction of their masters, that that too was property. Um, and, and what you saw on the outside was what there was on the inside. So these West Africans, these historic, the actual historical West Africans, which Melville then renders into this wonderful, wonderful novella, um, were able to play, manipulate the, 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 the attributes that they were thought to be loyal and simple-minded and transparent in order to give the lie to the stereotypes um, of what they were said not to have, cunning and, and reason and, and, uh, and discipline. And they did so under extreme, extreme circumstances. Melville doesn't write about any of this, but by the time they got into the South Pacific, and this is the South Pacific, this is not usually a precinct where we think of, a studying, of studying Atlantic world slavery, right? Uh, they had already survived a two-year ordeal. Most of them, many of them were, were from West Africa and they were, they were, many of them, including the leaders, were Muslim. They managed to track their, track their movements by following the, 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 the lunar calendar, Islamic calendar. Um, and uh, and they, they were brought into Montevideo, they were, driven across the American continent, across the Pampas, then over the Andes at the highest point, then down into the Pacific. So by the time they were in the, in the Pacific, they had already suffered a, a, a unbelievable amounts of hardship and suffering and death and misery. And yet they were able to call up this remarkable discipline. Um, by the time they ran into Delano's ship, they had already, they, they were about 50 days into their revolt. Um, and, uh, and, and, and they were out of food, they were out of water, and one could imagine that they would have, the pressure and, and, and temptation in order to do whatever they needed to do in order to get food and get water. Two women had died of dehydration, two infant children had died of dehydration, um, must have been all powerful and, and all consuming, and yet they somehow managed to, um, to, to, to shed off, to, to shed off the, the trappings of freedom, which a freedom which was proving ever more elusive every day they drifted in, in the South Pacific, and, um, and, and, uh, and managed to play the role of slaves, and in some ways, by, by, by performing that, that, that enslavement, claim some kind of higher freedom, to, to at least the power and, 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 um, and, and that it took to do that. Um, it was only late in the afternoon after Delano um, was completely, completely gulled by what was going on uh, and deceived by what was going on. He had climbed off of, he had, he had, he had managed, his men brought back water um, and food and he, had, he, he, had, he was growing increasingly obsessed with why Benito Cedeno, the Spaniard, wasn't really treating him with the respect or the intimacy which he thought he deserved and why he couldn't get Benito Cedeno alone, why he wouldn't leave his body servant, Mori. But he finally had given up on the whole thing and had climbed over the hull and back into his boat, ready to row back to his own ship. When um, Mori, who, pulled the, who was the primary actor in this deception, he was the playing the, playing the, the, the servant to Benito Cedeno, um, stepped out of character. Must have, must have been a moment of pride for having pulled this off after nine hours. And he asked Benito Cedeno, how many, how many, how many men does, De, does Delano have on his ship? And when he's told, you know, just a handful, because most of them was sealing on the island, he said, well, good, because we'll take it tonight. It won't, it, you know, we'll just need a handful of us to take that ship, and then we'll, we'll have that ship in order to return home. Benito Cedeno realizes that there's not going to be any any end to his, his misery and his ordeal and his captivity, he pitches himself off of the ship and he lands smack in the middle of Delano's boat. And it's only at that moment that Delano kind of realizes the reality of the situation. And then he marshals his men uh, on his ship to, to retake the slave ship, retake the ship, the rebel ship, and pacify it and put down the, the rebellion and re-enslave the, 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 the rebels, which I'll come back to in a little while. Um, it's also, what's remarkable about the story in some ways is that it, w it took place at almost exactly the same time that the German philosopher Hegel was, um, was writing, was composing the master-slave analogy, the metaphor uh, that, that some scholars of slavery has taken as the master, 
metaphor of slavery and freedom, right? The, 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 the metaphor of, the, of the, the, the master and the slave, the master who, who imagines himself to be omnipotent over the slave and then gradually comes to realize his own dependency and it's in that kind of dialectic of, of, um, of, de- of interdependency that, that human consciousness evolves, according to Hegel. In some ways, that, that's what's going on in this ship in the South Pacific. In some ways, this, these, these South Pacific West Africans are, are enacting it, except that it's not, a, not less, it's not just a dialectic. There's a third person, a Masa Delano, is witness to the dialectic, but he's too, he's too dense to realize what it is that he's seeing. Um, and there is there's, there's evidence that Melville had read Hegel, so who knows exactly what, what it may be. He, Maybe this kind of resonated. Um, but in any case, um, in the book, uh, The Empire of Necessity, I tell two stories. I tr- try to track two movements. One is the movement of the West Africans out of West Africa, across the Atlantic and into the Americas, and what I just mentioned earlier. And then the other is, um, is, is, is the movement of, of Massa Delano out of New England and into the South Pacific. And uh, it's a kind of intersection of two different forms of exploitation and violence, which I'll come back to later, but one obviously is human slavery and, and, and the race terror that emerges from it. And the other is, is the violence of sealing and, and, and one of the first, sealing being one of the first resource, uh, experiences of resource extraction of the United States beyond its borders. So Masa Delano is a sealer. And, and I think, there's, I think the, 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 the intersection of these two, um, these two institutions in, in a very dramatic way uh, says something about both, which I'll come, I'll come back to. Um, the event, um, the event uh, took place in 18, the re- rebellion on the ship, the, the Spanish ship was called the Trial, uh, took place in 1804 and the deception in early 1805 and it was a, a very consequential moment in what historians call the Age of Liberty. Uh, um, it was, 1804 was the year that Haiti declared independence um, after a long protracted insurgency and, 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 fend, and fending off France's attempts to reimpose slavery and reimpose colonialism. Um, a generation after the U.S. Revolution, a generation before the Spanish-American Revolution, um, at, at the height of what in Spanish America was, this, was the unleashing of the slave trade, what, um, what Spanish Americans, what, what, what Spain and Spanish merchants called in, in, in very frank terms, um, uh, without mincing any words, free trade in blacks. Uh, when we think of slavery, at least in the United States, um, it tends to focus on the, on the period before, the, the decades before the Civil War, the antebellum period, when, when slavery explodes with the invention of the cotton gin, the move into the Mississippi bottomlands, into Louisiana, into Texas, uh, the demand for cotton, demand for sugar, um, and, 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 and what this story allows is a kind of broadening of that and thinking about that as the last stage in a larger Pan, Pan American or Trans American uh, um, uh, uh, explosion or extension or expansion of slavery linked to free market, ca- linking, linked to the market revolution, to the, to the Atlantic market revolution. Um, slavery obviously existed in the, in the Americas since the, since the 1500s, but Theoretically, at least, it was regulated under a system of mercantilism. But starting in the 1770s, with each kind of revolu- burst of revolutionary order, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the execution of, of, of Louis the, of, 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 of Louis the um, 14th, the, um, the Haitian Revolution, um, Spain responded by, by deregulating the, free, the, the slave system, by granting Spanish-American merchants, Spanish merchants in the Americas, more and more freedom and more and more freedom to, to buy and sell human beings. Um, uh, uh, where previously only a handful of ports were entry points for slaves and, and for the importation of enslaved Africans, um, and only a handful of uh, very select companies or countries had the monopoly rights to bring, in, to bring in slaves, and only a handful of very well-connected merchants participated in the slave trade. By 1804, slavery was, 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 a, was a free-for-all. Uh, Montevideo was one of the ports that were, that, in which slavery was liberalized, deregulated, privatized, tariffs were lowered, taxes were lowered. More West Africans came in in 1804 when, when this group of West Africans came in um, to Montevideo than in any year previously. Um, uh, uh, what's in, one of the things that's interesting about this story is that one group, 
of, of these West Africans who, who came into Montevideo, they came in in different, in different consignments and different ships, um, had actually been on their way to, um, on their way to um, the Caribbean um, uh, on a Liverpool slaver when it was intercepted by a French Jacobin pirate. Um, and uh, and um, it was a, 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 an ardent defender of the French Revolution, um, uh, loyal to Napoleon. Um, and, and, uh, and he presided over a, a, a multi hued crew of men of all, all, all nations from Africa, from Haiti, from, from Spanish America, from the Mediterranean. Um, and, and in some ways you would think of them as kind of holding, of, of, of holding to this, this, this image we have of pirates and privateers as, um, as proto-anarchists sailing the ever free sea enthralled to no man or to no nation. But in, 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 in the case of this ship and other French privateers, they were really were the vanguards of Spanish American uh, capitalism, merchant capitalism. This particular ship had, um, had contractual relations with Montevideo and, and Buenos Aires merchants in which they were to seize British goods and bring them into the Rio de, Rio de la Plata, into Montevideo and Buenos Aires. And by far the most profitable cargo was slaves were enslaved Africans. And one group was on a Liverpool slaver, as I mentioned, and it was intercepted and then brought into Montevideo. Um, it was, um, you know, so what I try to do in the book was, well, and let me just say that one of the great things, one of the fascinating things about this story is, um, is, um, is, is tracking this, this privateer, this French privateer. It was actually captained by, um, by, by a, by a, by a, um, by a Frenchman who had lost his arm. So, so there's actually a one-armed French pirate that starts the story, which I never realized how much I wanted to start a book with a one-armed French pirate until I, <laughs> until I actually did. And the men in his crew had trouble saying his name because his name was, I, I, I can't pronounce it because I don't speak French, but it was Francisco Hippolito Modet, no sé qué. And um, so the men, the, men on the, the men on his crew, the Sp particularly the Spaniards, called him um, Capitan Manco because he only had one arm, so Manco being a Spanish, you know, crippled or one arm. And, uh, and, and Morday was upset not by the nickname, but by the rank. He preferred to go by the name Citizen Manco, because he was a, he was a French privateer. So I think it somehow captures the, you know, there's, there's really a floating contradiction of the age of revolution and the age of, the age, how the age of liberty was also the age of slavery. Um, Edmund Morgan, a historian writing in the 1970s, looking at colonial Virginia, came up with that famous phrase, the paradox of American slavery and American freedom, showing the ways in very real and material and ideological ways in, and political how, 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 uh, how American freedom was dependent on and defined by slavery. So I try to take that paradox and, and think about it on, 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 an American, on a larger American level. Um, the ways in which ideas of freedom and ideas of, of in, a, in a distinction and autonomy and preference and interest, all of the things that we think about associated with republicanism and liberalism were formed very much rooted in, 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 in the slave system and the expansion of this, of, of, and the, the centrality of slavery in the expansion of the market revolution in the Americas and particularly in, 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 um, in, in also in, in South America. Uh, with the expansion of, of what, what I mentioned Spaniards called free trade in blacks. Um, you know, it, it seems like a, a, an abstraction to say that the age of um, freedom was also the age of slavery, but one statistic that, that I was blown away by was historians do estimate that about 12 and a half million Africans were taken out of Africa and brought to the Americas. They have documentation on ships and, and about, of about over 10 million of, of, of that estimated 12.5, if not higher. Um, more than half came in after July 4th, 1776. So you get a real sense of the ways in which in, 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 you know, the age of slavery was also the age of freedom. Um, in Spanish America, one of the things that the book tries to do is, 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 is there's an implicit comparison with the plantation system of slavery in North America, which develops, and a much more diverse uh, 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 labor system involved in coerced in, enslaved Africans and South and African Americans in South America. Um, the way slavery was, um, the way slaves 
served every part of that market revolution. They were commodities, they were capital, they were credit, they were collateral, they were status symbols for a, for a, for a, for a, for a rising gentry and a rising bourgeoisie and a rising merchant class. They, 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 they served as adornments for a declining aristocracy that was latching on to something solid. Uh, in this world of flux that the, you know that, that was being revolutionized by the, by by market capitalism they they became objects of nostalgia and and, and by tracking this movement across the americas i think i, I was what i would think i was trying to get a panorama a snapshot of that and think about the ways slavery was central to the age of freedom and the age and, and the age of liberty um, you know uh so the other story um uh uh, is, is Amasa Delano. Um, in Melville's hand, Melville re renders him as, as, um, as the first in a long line of American idiots abroad, U.S. innocents abroad that, you know, I know we're in Canada, but I can't help but use the word American, but, you know, American, American you know, this kind of, um, uh, think of Graham Greene's The Quiet American, right, the, that go about in the world unable to connect the consequences of the disaster that th that they th that their actions have provoked, um, and it's really this remarkable, remarkable portrait and, and fictionalization of Amasa, of Amasa Delano, and powerful in its own right, and and subtle in, all, in even in, even in the way that it's rendered, he's rendered into this one-dimensional prototype of that kind of avatar of American innocence. It's subtle and deep and profound in all sorts of ways. But the real Amasa Delano, in some ways, I think, tells a different story of of uh, of, of the of the centrality of um, of of uh, it tells a different story about American expansion and America and and, and, and Americans going abroad. And, um, uh, uh, Delano was, in many ways, a new man of the American Revolution. He was born uh, 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 just a few years. He was born in the last year of the of the Seven Year War. Uh, a few decades, a few years before the American Revolution. He came of age during the American Revolution. The American Revolution, he was born in Duxbury, which is a coastal town in Massachusetts, a shipbuilding town, a fishing town, that um, really was a hotbed of, um, of, of natural law liberalism, and uh, an early town to move away from Calvinist gloom and embrace a much more optimistic version of, 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 of human nature. The idea that human beings were perfectible, that there was no, there was no predestination, that, uh, that, 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 that individuals, men, could, um, could harness their discipline, their virtue, and their reason to tame their passions and their appetites and their vices and govern themselves. And that belief being the kind of foundation of a Republican theory of governance. And Duxbury really was a paradigm of that, a hotbed of that. Uh, a number of ministers that would go on to form, that become early, um, early Unitarians came out of Duxbury. And Amasa Delano comes, at, comes from, a, from, a, from a, a, a small craftsman's family, a fishing family, a shipbuilding family, uh, a family that did okay, um, but didn't do, that didn't grow cr very wealthy as Duxbury after the, after the years of the American Revolution began to stratify economically and some people in town grew increasingly rich. He came from a fam family that, 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 um, that, uh, that wasn't poor, that, that did well in, in, in shipbuilding and in fishing, but at a moment where, um, where going abroad was in some ways the way in which um, in an increasingly stratified uh, local economy, going abroad was the only way he could balance virtue and ambition, right? I mean, if he stayed within Duxbury um, in, in, a, in a town that was growing economically stratified with more and more poor people, more and more concentrated wealth, um, you would either have to confront that wealth and, and, and give in to envy and give in to ambition and, 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 and unleash the kind of um, the kind of passions that you would see later with the French Revolution and, and Amasa Delano in his memoir explicitly would draw comparisons between the American Revolution and the French Revolution or you could go abroad and going abroad was a way to be both ambitious and be virtuous at the same time as a way of balancing that and um, there's, 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 a, there's almost there's a pathos in, 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 uh, in, in Delano's memoir I, Melville was attracted I think to that chapter 18 where he recounted his uh, 
where he recounted his experiences on board the, uh, you know, being duped on board the Spanish, on board the Spanish uh, cargo ship that was carrying these West Africans. But the whole memoir is, is, is really just this remarkable, uh, you know, Delano wrote it, um, he said, to contribute to the world's stock of knowledge, kind of like an encyclopedia. But, but, but as he recounts um, his adventures, it's almost a testament to the impossibility of knowledge or the impossibility of doing anything with that knowledge once you have it. Um, one thing, it's, 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 it's a parade and a procession of, of fiascos and disasters and mortifications, a word that, that repeatedly appears in his memoir. He's mostly a failure at everything. Um, he's catapulted into the, the, the American Revolution catapults him into world history. And he's, he's, he witnesses some of the events that we think of as creating the modern world. He's in South Africa at the beginnings of racial segregation. He's in, Brit he's in India at the beginning of British colonialism. He experiences the French Revolution in the Indian Ocean and Ile de France. He's, he's in the Galapagos a few, a few decades before, before Darwin is. He's, he witnesses the Battle of Saratoga. Um, but he can't quite make sense or he can't quite get a handle on it. The promise, I think, of the American Revolution is always always out, just out of his grasp. Um, the one exception is when he becomes a sealer. And, um, and sealing was this remarkable, remarkable uh, industry that, that, uh, that in many ways was the first experience of the United States with boom and bust resource extraction outside of its borders. We think of whaling, and we think of whaling largely because of Melville's wonderful description of it in Moby Dick. Um, sealing was something else entirely. Um, it, it took place, the boom was a few years in the 1790s, and the bust came, came with remarkable, with a remarkable, um, and remarkable quickness in, in, in the early 1800s. Um, whaling took place on a watery commons, open to all. Sealing took place, and it invokes, and in Melville's hands, whaling is, is a kind of, industry that is brutal and violent and bloody, but it's also sublime in the sense that it integrates human, it integrates races together, it integrates men together in working and extracting and boiling the, the, the rendering the whale oil, rendering the whale, whale fat into oil. There's some loving descriptions of that in, in, in Moby Dick. Sealing was something else in, entirely. If whaling and suggested proto-industrialization and the solidarity that, that could take place within industrialization. Uh, sealing was settler colonialism. It happened on land. Uh, it, it took no skill to kill the seals. Um, and, and, it, and, and there were often remark, and it often resulted in bloody and, bloody and pitched battles among sealing crews and once I, and laying, and with a remarkable short of time, period of time, laying, leaving these islands completely wasted and, 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 and denuded of seals. And Amasa Delano was there at the beginning and he was there at the end. He was there for the boom and he was there at the bust. His first sealing expedition was in the 1790s. And, um, and uh, there were hundreds of thousands of seals on beach after beach, rookery after rookery, on beach after beach, on island after island, these islands off of, off of, the, off of Chile in, in, in the South Pacific. Um, and uh, Delano himself took hundreds of thousands of seals and brought them to Canton. And, uh, and traded them for porcelain and for spice and for tea and, uh, and, and did quite well in his first sealing voyage. He, um, this was one of his, the, the, the one moment of success that he has in his memoir. Um, uh, um, by the time of his um, second voyage, the seals were gone. Uh, first, he, want, he, he, know, he, hears, he, he hears that the seals um, have, have dis what happened was that uh, uh, so many seals skins were coming into Canton that the price began, the mar market became glutted, um, and uh, and seal skins were rotting on the dock in the rain. They couldn't fit into the warehouses, and the price began to collapse. And that led sealers to accelerate the killing. It was almost as all or nothing a system of labor relations and environmental exploitation as one could imagine. Um, as, as, uh, as profits dried up, um, fights and mutinies and, 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 um, and, uh, and fraud between officers and, and crew uh, became increasingly commonplace. It was almost an all or nothing system of rela labor relations as you could imagine before, before any given ship was able to fill its hull, hull, hold with seals. They were 
the captains and officers were completely dependent on, on the SEAL crews that they left on board, on, on, on shore on these islands. Uh, and the time that they left them on, on, these, on these islands increased as the SEAL herds disappeared, as the rookeries disappeared. Um, and then as soon as, the, as soon as the hold was full, the crews and the officers didn't need the men, and they often abandoned them, abandoned them in Span in, on the Spanish main or on these islands or in Canton and without giving them their share. Um, there was, so it increased tensions among, ship, among um, sh sealing ships and expeditions and within the ships themselves. And if Amasa Delano was there for the boom, he was there for the bust. So in 1803, he leaves Boston, and he first heads to Tasmania, to Australia, um, because he hears that the, that the seals are few in, 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 on the islands off of Chile. Um, and, but there are no seals in, 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 in Tasmania, in the Bass Straits. Um, he loses his men, his men jump ship because there's no money to be made. He's, he, he's forced to take on a crew of escaped convicts from Hobart, the, the British penal colony, you know, in a settlement in Tasmania. He heads back, he decides to head back towards, ch towards Chile in order to see if there's any seals there. As men start to grouse, they start to conspire. He resorts to more and more physical punishment in order to maintain authority until he intersects with the trial. The, the Spanish, the Spanish uh, cargo ship carrying the slaves, captained by Benito Cedeno. And what, um, and what that experience, once the deception is revealed, and once he's, and, and he mobilizes as many marshals as men to put down the slave revolt with, with unbelievable brutality. They use the sealing lances, that they, the lances that they use to, to skin the seals in order to disembowel. Uh, uh, some of the some of the rebels, some of the some of the the, the, the rebels that refused to surrender on board the ship, and it, it was an unbelievably bloody bloody scene. And uh, in so doing, he, he he even though he himself is opposed to slavery, he's able to reestablish his his authority over his men. Um, and I think that this is a, a moment, a, a very very visceral moment, visceral in a literal sense, in the terms of the viscera on, that spilled out on board the deck of the trial. Uh, in which, in which, in which race terror and ecological violence kind of intersect, and you see the way race, kind of race, racism emerges out of this context of ecological exhaustion, uh, and this race terror. You know, Amasa Delano is an interesting. Um, both the historical Amasa Delano and the fictionalist Amasa Delano are interesting. Are interesting to think about as juxtaposed to the other more famous creation of Melville Ahab. Ahab is often thought about as a, as a, um, as a, uh, as a, as a, as a, as, as a symbol, uh, an icon of unhinged American power. Oliver Stone has a great line in Platoon where he where he equates the, um, somebody who, who uh, the sergeant who massacres an innocent Vietnamese village with Ahab. Edward Said famously compared George Bush's hunt for pursuit of, of Saddam Hussein, obsession with Saddam Hussein, to Ahab. But I think that Ahab actually, I think that thinking about Ahab as an emblem of U.S. power misses the mark in some ways, and, and in some ways is, is too easy an analogy. Ahab is a rebel. He's an exception. He hunts his, his white whale with a monomania that, that goes against all economic rationality. There's a great scene in Moby Dick where Starbucks says, you know, uh, you know, this obsession with the white whale is, is, uh, is, is detrimental to the owners of the Pequod. And Ahab says, owners, owners, what can Ahab, you know, let them stand on a Nantucket beach and howl into the wind, you know, uh, you know I, don't, I don't care. He, he's, he's a rebel. He's often held up not just as a symbol of American power, but as a symbol of kind of totalitarian 20th century power, a certain kind of mes Meratic, charismatic power that which was able to bind his men or pull his men into his emotional thrall through his charisma, and so he becomes a symbol of of of, of totalitarianism, be it of the left or the right. But again, I think that misses the mark. I think Amasa Delano, in some ways, is a much more useful and much more complicated symbol of American expansion and American empire. He's not the exception; he's the rule. Uh, he is faithful to the laws of capital, and throughout his book, he talks about the need to, 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 be, to, to stay loyal and faithful to institutions, whether they're the, his financial backers or his insurers. Um, and uh, even though he's a, 
opposed to slavery. He winds up, he gets caught up in the laws of supply and demand. He gets caught up in this ecological vortex, this, you know, of, of diminishing natural resources. And, uh, and, and, and he rallies his men, uh, uh, you know, not in pursuit of a metaphysical white whale, but in pursuit of black, of black rebels. And I think that this is, a, you know, a, a, it lends itself to a very, a very graphic and, 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 um, an explosive moment in which ecological violence and, and race violence come together, and in fact, where, race, where racism itself is formed in some ways. Um, one of the things that Melville changes, Melville largely stays faithful to, to, um, to Massa Delano's account from chapter 18. Uh, he fills it with that, that atmospherics and, and tells it from Massa Delano's point of view, which is, which is Melville's, the value, the value, the value added part of, of Melville. But then at the end, he changes it a bit. He has, um, after the slave rebellion is put down and after the events, the reality of the situation is revealed to readers and the, and the, and the, and the slave revolt is put down and some of the West Africans are, are executed, um, he, has, he ends the story with Amasa Delano consoling a broken and shattered Benito Sereno, Sereno, not Sereno, the, the, the literary character. Um, in a monastery in Peru, um, and 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 he um, he tries to get Benito Sereno to to cheer up, and it's this incredible moment where he um, he says, "Look at the blue sky, and look at the trade winds that caress our cheek, and look at the look at the look at the sea. Like they they've moved on. Why can't you move on?" And Benito Sereno says, "Because they're not human. Because they have no memory." And it's this remarkable moment for two reasons. One, I think it, it captures something about, you know, basically I think it's Melville's critique of, of the blindness of, of, of American empire, of U.S. empire, and the inability, you know, inability to, to witness to the dialectic but not being able to understand the dialectic. Um, but what's also interesting about it is that that's not what happened. In real life, um, in, in the actual event, Delano spends about eight months trying to get half of the value of the, of the surviving slaves. A number of the slaves are brought back to Talcahuano, a port city in, in southern Chile, and then to Concepcion, where they're put on trial and they're, ex and they're executed. But about 50 or 60 of them, about 50 of them, are, are sent on to Lima, where they're sold in the Lima, Lima market. And, 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 and Delano engages in this, in this in this dogged pursuit of, Benito, of, the real, of the historical Benito Sereno. There's no counseling or comforting. They have this falling out, and, and, it's, this, um, and it's this remarkable uh, uh, you know, mercantile or, or mercenary pursuit. And again, I, it, it was driven by economic necessity, the need to pay the men on a ship in order to keep their loyalty. And, and, and this, he winds up getting some of the money, but not, you know, not as much as he had hoped. Um, and he goes back, he winds up back in the United States and the rest of his life is largely a, largely a bust. He goes and he f comes back to a, a changed America, a changed New England, uh, and he falls into debt. He's in debt as prison and he dies in 1823, about the year that, um, it's an interesting year, it's the year of the Monroe Doctrine, it's the year most of the Americas have declared themselves republic and, uh, a Republican and he, and he passes away. Um, I think maybe I could come. I could talk a little bit more about Delano, but I think maybe what I'll do is is just wrap up by talking a little bit about what I meant by the title, "The Empire of Necessity." Melville um, Melville uses it's a phrase from Melville, "The Empire of Necessity." It's in it's it, there's a, Melville has another remark, a fascinating short story called "The Bell Tower" that he publishes around the time of Benito Sereno, um, and he has an epigraph to that story that says that seeking to conquer a larger liberty, man but extends the empire of necessity. What's great about it is that he attributes it to an, um, an anonymous author, an unpublished manuscript in the author's possession, but many Melvillians think that he actually just made it up and then it, and he just wrote it himself and then attributed it to this, 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 this unpublished manuscript. So it's kind of creating this authority and citing it. Um, in any case, um, Melville believed in, in, in emancipation. He believed in universal freedom. But he refused an idea of freedom that defined itself as the opposite of slavery. As he grew older, he increasingly criticized what he described as a vile liberty that he felt that was taking hold in the United States. He thought that most people lived somewhere between the 
two poles of liberty and freedom that define the political rhetoric of anti-Bell, Jacksonian American and, and anti-Bellum America. Um, and I think that that was what he was getting at with the phrase of empire of necessity, seeking to conquer a larger liberty uh, man but extends the empire of necessity. To my mind, the idea conveys forward motion. Um, it hints that it's not the paradox of freedom and slavery that's the problem, but the denial of the paradox, right? Um, uh, the inability, or the inability to see the paradox, again, like Amasa Delano on board the trial, watching the Spaniard and the West African and not being able to see what was what. Um, America's ceaseless, United States' ceaseless bids to escape the paradox, to slip out of the shackles of history, only serve to deepen older, old entanglements and, and create new necessities. The way, for example, the, 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 the opening of the West which was held up as a solution to the crisis of slavery in the East, wound up accelerating the crisis um, and accelerating the rest of war. The way the rise of free trade uh, promised and still promises that if men were set free to pursue their interests, uh, uh, an ever more harmonious world would, would result. Um, and in the United States today, I think that we see the, res resident, or the residue of, 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 of uh, this ideal that, um, that Melville was criticizing. Um, a purer or, or, or more perverse notion of freedom has come to hold sway, at least among some, based not just on the fantasy of free trade but, and small government, but on a more primal animus, uh, an individual supremacy that not only denies the necessities that bind people together, but resents any reminder of those necessities. Um, Herman Melville spent most of his whole life Write, a whole writing career considering the problem of freedom and slavery, but um, he often did so elliptically, intent it seemed on disentangling the experience from the particularities of skin color, of geography, of economics. He rarely wrote about human bondage as an actual social institution, a historical institution with victims and victimizers, but rather as an existential or a, or a philosophical condition common to all. Who ain't a slave is a, is a line from from Moby Dick, and, and the answer to that is nobody, but the answer, he offers that in a kind of joyous way, in an acceptance of who ain't a slave, acceptance of one's bondage, you know, that we're all fast fish, we're all loose fish at the same time, we're all entangled in whale lines, is an acceptance of the human condition. Um, Benito Sereno is an exception, where he actually does talk about slavery as a real institution. But even here, I think by forcing the reader to adopt the perspective of Amasa Delano, Melville is concerned less with exposing specific social horrors than with revealing, as I mentioned earlier, slavery is foundational deception. Not just the fantasy that some men were natural slaves, but the others were absolutely free. There's a sense reading the story that Melville knew or he feared that the fantasy wouldn't end, that after abolition, if abolition ever came, uh, it would adapt itself to new circumstances, becoming ever more elusive and ever more entrenched in human affairs. And I, I think that that's, it's this awareness and it's dread that makes Benito Sereno uh, so enduring a story. There's a sense that Melville identified in Amasa Delano uh, uh, the emergence of a new kind of racism, a racism that wasn't uh, based on religious or philosophical doctrine, but on the psychic need to divine one's uh, absolute freedom in opposition to another's absolute slavishness. This is racism that was born in chattel slavery, but didn't die with chattel slavery. It involved in today's cult of individual supremacy that, that, that I think is very much present in, in US political culture and political discourse that try as it might, can't shake off its white supremacist roots. So we have politicians in the United States like Rand Paul, who could say with a straight face that belief in the ideal of healthcare, or the right to health, is like believing in the right to enslave other people. And I, I think that, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's crazy on the face of it, but I think that there's, there's, a, there's a logic to those kind of equations, that when you pull them out of the soil, the substrata that they're embedded in, and you see the roots, I think the root, they, they, they can't escape this, this history of chattel slavery, this free trade in blacks, which kind of imprinted itself in, 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 in the American political culture in different degrees. There's a, a in some ways, there's an implicit comparison with, um, with Latin America, which I, which I don't make explicitly and overtly at the end. 
but um, but but different ways in which they want the important the centrality of slavery as an institution in defining one's 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 recognition of the empire of necessity, and I think it's reflected in, in ongoing the ongo ongoing endurance of social democracy and social democratic ideals in Latin America and 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 the, the kind of individual democracy that that is supreme in the United States. Um, I could talk more, but I, I don't. I have no idea how long I've gone on for. So maybe I'll just end there, and um, maybe we can bring up the lights, and and I can I can we can answer I can answer questions if there are any questions. Thank you so much. So do you want to? I can I can help pick people out of the audience. Sure, you can pick would people. Would anyone, anyone have any questions? They said that. Um, you have to bring the microphone because. Oh, okay. Where, where is there? Okay. Um, yeah. Anyone have any questions? Thoughts. Thank you for an excellent talk. I, there's a series of different kind of questions that are lurking that I might have trouble articulating. So I'll start with the last one and then afterwards I can ask the others. And that has to do with the final analogy you made with Latin America and the kind of reverse, if I'm following the extension of the argument, the reverse form in which the relationship with the institution of slavery plays itself out in social democracy. So I, was just, I just kind of wanted to hear the, the end of that argument, and then I'll ask the other questions. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh. Um, well, I think that, um, I think it, it, it transcends slavery. I think that it has to do with the way the colonial Spanish state dealt with difference. I think right from its inception, it was a colonial state that was both universal in its conception and giving rise to, a, to many of the pre premises of international law and universal law that we think of. But it administered itself, and it, 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 was, it, was, it was administratively set, set up to administer difference. And I think that, um, I think that was, it was, I think that difference, whether it be slavery or whether it be the enslavement of Native Americans and the mobilization of Native Americans to extract value um, in all sorts of different ways, or whether it be slavery in the slave zones of Latin America, was, um, was much more central to the colonial project. And I think that the re re Republicans who inherited that, who believed that they were transcending it, um, dealt, ha had to deal with the problem of race and difference in, in a much more direct way. I think the colonial experience in the America was, 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 was about denial of, of, the, of, of difference and the, the, the ideological fiction of, 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 of um, of pushing difference off to the side, even as, even as that was not actually the case. And I think that that gave rise to two very distinct forms of republicanism. One, a republicanism that emphasizes the creation of a virtuous state, that sees the state as, as being a much more active role in creating a virtuous society, that, that virtue wasn't going to emerge emerge magically out of the unleashing of individual interests and a republicanism that was pre that imagined a state as a defender of, of, of individual as the, the unleashing of individual interests and that's where virtue arises and um, and I think I think that's I think that's the general comparison where slavery fits in within within that I think I think is is, is it could you know is, is um, it deserves more attention, which I didn't do in the book, and I don't really have an answer. I also think it's interest. I think the role of um, slavery in relationship, when the respective wars of independence come in relationship to slavery. So, the fact that um, the fact that slavery expands after the um, after the, the 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 American Revolution in the United States, and that that explosion of free trade slavery takes place after. I think there's a there's a way in which in which um, what we would think of as social rights and economic rights could be disentangled from political rights, whereas in Spanish America, and, and um, I think that that disentanglement wasn't possible because the, because the market revolution and the explosion of slavery took place before the movement for independence. And even though it was graduated and deferred in all sorts of ways in different countries, and you know, in the, sl abolition didn't come about with independence in Spanish America, you know, all you know at the same time simultaneously. I think that um, I think there was much more of a, of a of a sense that 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 independence involved abolition 
even if it took, even if it, in actuality it took longer to get where I, where I think that, where in, I think that's, that would be another point of comparison for the emergence of these two distinct political cultures. You have another question? Um, thank you so much, so interesting. And I have about a thousand questions as well that I'd love to ask. Um, but I wanted to just pick up on something that you mentioned at in sort of the first part of your discussion, where I, you, you brought up the idea, I mean, throughout you've talked about freedom and notions of freedom, and sort of the complicated ways that different, differently positioned people th thought about freedom. Um, so whether they were in Europe or all, already in colonized parts of the world. Uh, but then you specifically spoke to the ways in which the African slaves on the boat performed freedom. Yeah. And I thought that was a really interesting so, notion. And I wondered if you could expand on that. Okay. So, um, one of the things involved in, in recounting and in, in researching the story that I didn't have time to go into much was um, was the role of Islam in 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 uh, shaping the perception. And I'll, I, let me just let me just premise this by saying that there isn't a lot of documentation. The documentation is all span is all official documentation, right? Man, you know, imputing to the West African. So getting at trying to get at the experience of what West, the West Africans were thinking or doing is all a matter of speculation and, and, and supposition. It's, there's no, there's, but, um, but the Spaniards did identify them as Muslim and as literate Muslim. And I thought that was kind of, I thought that was interesting in a number of different ways. One, the revolt happened on the ho holiest day of Ramadan, the night of power. They rose up on, and, and the, it was also the day, interestingly enough, that, um, that the largest slave, urban slave uprising in the America, in Bahia in 1835, which, was, which, was, which historians have documented was largely an Islamic uprising, uh, also took place on the, on the night of power. So it's just an interesting similarity, the, the importance. So it's, it's, the, it's the day in, 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 in Islam, in theology, where, um, in the Quran, where, where the angel Gabriel reveals the first verses of the Quran. And it's a prophetic day, and it's a day in that one could imagine as kind of reconciling, trying to reconcile human action and will with predestination and, 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 and uh, God intervening in, in history. So it must have been, a, it was a very powerful day within the Islamic character. And the fact that they were, that two years after the beginning of their ordeal, they were able to, they were able to, you know, document that, you know, start the rebellion on the, on the night of power or the night of destiny. Uh, is fairly remarkable, but but one of the things that the Spaniard documents, Spanish documents, often mentioned a number of times was that they were literate. They that at least Mori and Babo and the leaders of the rebellion and the leaders of the deception were able to read and write in their own language. So much so that they they even before they ran into Massa Delano, they forced Benito Cedeno to sign a contract saying that they would they, that if he returned them to West Africa, they would they would let him leave with his ship. So they had they were well versed in maritime law and contractual law, which is interesting, which also might have been related to the fact that they were they were Muslim. Um, a lot of this literature on slavery emphasizes the oral traditions of West Af of African slaves and the trickster traditions, and that was, would be one way to approach this, right? The trickster, the, the being able to kind of perform and 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 and, and deceive and do this New Englander. But I thought it would be more interesting to try to think about the deception in terms of Islam and in terms of what it meant um, and what the relationship is between freedom and slavery. And if Amasa Delano represented uh, a certain kind of um, uh, strong, emancip strong individualistic tradition within Christianity that began to emphasize the possibility of human autonomy and independence and self-governance and, and, and which lays the groundwork for, for abolitionist, Christian abolitionist movements later. Um, Islam 
has a much more Melvillian understanding of the relationship of freedom to slavery. And there's a great Sufi um, quotation from, from a theologian that um, says, that runs something like the, 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 um, uh, the true meaning of freedom is the perfection of slavery. And so if Babo and Mori had some experience, and, and they came from a place, not only were they Muslim, they came from West Africa, which had its own traditions of slavery and enslavement. They might have been slaves in West Africa. They might have been slaveholders in West Africa. Um, so they, 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 and, they and, and Islam has, has, is, a, is a religion that has a deep, deep engagement with the problem of slavery and the problem of freedom in different ways. And their resolu and its re resolution, as I mentioned, tends to be more Melvillian in its understanding of, a, of, of n n not, a, not oppositional, but much more relational. And so in, in some ways, that's what Babo, Mori, and the West, of the rest, West Africans did. They, they, um, they perfected, they, they, they achieved freedom by perfecting slavery, by performing slavery. Um, and, and, and again, in the, lo in the larger context of what we do know is that um, they were starving and they were desperate. There was no more food left. They were through a number of storms. They, um, uh, Benito Cedeno was stalling. He was sailing up and down the, uh, the, the, the Chilean coast trying to do everything he could to avoid uh, rounding the Cape. Um, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and so that freedom which they, that they had seized up, that they had risen up and seized on the holiest day of, of the Islamic calendar was proving ever more fragile, ever more illusionary, as with every day they would drift in the Pacific. So in some ways what, what, what their performance was was, was, um, was the enactment of this, of this understanding of the, the relationship of freedom is the perfection of slavery. You know, I, this is all, again, speculation, but I was trying to think through it in ways that, um, that you know, um, imagining uh, 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 the importance of this kind of literate theological tradition uh, of West African Islam on, on their actions rather than thinking about how oftentimes historians of slavery tend to emphasize the, you know, the, the, the rural orality and the folk tales that are passed around the campfires of the tricksters and, and, and thinking about that. I think that would have been an easier way to, to, to think about what they were doing, but I was trying to think about it in, 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 in situated in, in, in terms of Islam. Any, okay, oh, okay we'll, we'll do you and then you. Go, go ahead. I'll oh, okay, pass. thank you. Um, you were talking about uh, how Melville's, this novella of Melville's is kind of an exception, right? That he didn't write so explicitly about yeah. political things like, like this. And even the, uh, the line that Empire's Necessity comes from, he sort of distanced himself from it without, not necessarily tripping, if it, if it was him, yeah. he distanced himself from it. Right. So do you think he's sort of maybe guilty too, in a way of... Melville had a complicated relationship, yeah. <laughs> you know. I mean, he he um he wrote, you know, he he was he um he was paralyzed by the problem of slavery. You know, a, a lot of a lot of people of his generation, including Nathaniel Hawthorne and his father-in-law Lemuel Shaw, they were they were Democrats and they believed in that slavery should end, but they they believed more firmly in the preservation of the union. And and Melville Melville was much, I, he was, I think, paralyzed by what he thought was the impasse of, of antebellum America, that you could, you, could, you could fight to end slavery and possibly destroy the Union, or you could leave slavery in place and admit that um, freedom for some required the enslavement of others. And, um, and I think that, that, that he saw that as a much more deeper, deeper impasse, and he, and he never, where others of his generation, like Nathaniel Hawthorne and a lot of these Boston politicians like Daniel Webster and all of these people, I worked out all sorts of compromises with the South in order to keep them, you know, keep them within the Union. He never reconciled himself to that impasse. The people around him would too easily reconcile themselves to that impasse. Um, it's complicated. What's complicated is that people don't actually really know much about Melville and, and his political position, so there's a lot of projecting onto his writings, which are rich. Bartleby the Scribner's critique of, of commodification of social relations. Benito Sereno is a, obviously Moby Dick could be read in any sorts of way, but there's not a lot. 
He doesn't, in his letters, he's not, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't reveal himself as a political man. And so a lot of, Mel, there's, there's left, Mel, left Melvillians who want to say that he was a critic of empire and, indivi and, and American individualism and slavery. And then there are right Melvillians who say, well, he might have been interested in those things and he could be a cutting critic of hypocrisy, but he really was concerned about more existential things and more cosmic matters. And, and what, what I find fascinating is, um, is there's ways in which, I think that Melville's metaphysics were ultimately about slavery. I mean, he was concerned with um, the individ what meaning an individual had in, in relationship to larger structures of authority. What was the meaning of, 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 of individuality in a world that was rendered in a cosmos that was being, that was being disenchanted by Darwin. Um, he was concerned with metaphysics, with trying to grasp the reality behind the pa pasteboard mask of a, of, 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 of a world that, was, that seemed to be ever more elusive and ever more, and ever more in, which reality, in which the mask isn't hiding reality, but the mask is reality. And all of those things, I think, are ultimately about slavery. I think Melville's metaphysical, metaphysics are ultimately about slavery and capitalism, and whether he himself knew that it was. And so here's an example. This is a little bit of a, so there's lots of, so, there's, so what I try to do in the book is, is tell the story with an integrity that it deserves, which is in 1805, which is about the age of revolution, and then think about what Melville 50 years later was sore in the story as the, as, as the, in, with the particular to the US in the 1850s. That's, that's two very different things. Um, what's interesting about it is, so, so there's, but there's all sorts of ways in which slavery keeps revealing itself in, 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 um, in, in, as being more central to Melville's outlook. So, uh, so there is one passage in this novel in 1849 that he publishes, Redburn, in which he um, stumbles across in Liverpool, the character representing Melville, stumbles in Liverpool on a statue of, of Lord Nelson, Horatio Nelson, who died, who died in the Battle of Trafalgar few, you know, in, in the early 1800s. And um, most statues to Trafalgar are very, in London are very, uh, to, to Nelson are very simple affairs. In London there's you know, him in a full dress uniform aboard this column. But in Liverpool, it's this grotesque statue of a, of a naked Lord Nelson falling back into, into, death's, into, into death's arms with a, with, a, with, a, with a skeleton reaching up to grab his heart, and around the base are these four uh, prisoners of war in shackles, and they're meant to represent Spanish and French prisoners. But then Melville in Redburn says, he goes on this extended riff about how he could never look at those prisoners of war without thinking of African slaves in the marketplace. And then from there he goes on to the wealth that, that, that the wrongs of Africa created and how it built the city of Liverpool and how it built the Carolinas and Virginia. And it's this incredible two paragraphs, three paragraphs, it's almost stream of consciousness in which, in which it's not so much the ideas that, that he's expressing are, are important, which they are, that, that the wealth of slavery creates create the prosperity of the West, but it's almost a, a talking cure, the way in which he's, you know, it's one thing after another, you know, one, one association after another is reminding him of slavery. What's fascinating about that is, um, so he writes that in 1849, um, in, in about six years before he writes Benito Cedeno. That statue was put up in, I think, in the 1810s, and it was raised uh, primarily with, there were a number of different sla Liverpool slavers and merchants who put up that statue. But um, the, John Bolton, the man who, the, the merchant who owned the, the, the Liverpool slaver that was intercepted by that citizen Manco, was the person who raised that statue. So in other words, um, so the statue that first prompted Melville to think about slavery in a real historical and political way was raised by one of the men responsible for bringing the West Africans, at least out of West Africa, into the Americas that would later inspire Melville to write his master, masterpiece, Benito Cedeno. So it's, it's these ways in which it's, you know, slavery is just embedded in his thoughts that, that you know, it's inescapable. And I think that, I think that, 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 that speaks, it says what, and it says a lot of different things. Yeah. 
Thank you. There's just, just so much to think about in, in, in everything that you've said. Um, but, but maybe two things, and I, I, if there is a question in this, I'm struck by the imagery, you know, at the beginning with this ship v looking as though it's actually appearing out of the ocean, and, and then your last reference a few seconds ago to the sense in which Melville is sort of obsessed with the issue of slavery, and he chooses to think about it and write about it in the context of the sea, and the slavery, uh, I mean, other than the example that you've given, the slavery that he's reflecting about is really a slavery that takes place on land. Of course, the ship plays an important part in the journeys. And, 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 and so the context for the story that you're telling is the sea. I wonder if there's a way in which you could sort of make the context also part of the thinking. I, I'm curious about the extent to which the sea might be something that Melville is not just thinking um, on, but is actually thinking with. So there's a, you, you talked about the elusiveness, for example, uh, of, of this thing called freedom. And you, you, you think of the sea as, you know, symbolizing something free and floating, and, but, but also constraining at the same time these, the running out of food. Yeah. So I'm curious about making the possibility for making the backdrop, the context, more explicit as a thought process. Yeah. Well, I mean, in very in a more prosaic way, a lot of there are a lot of Mel, Melville political theorists like Melville because there is a there's, on these ships represent political society and the hierarchy of political society and all sorts of ways in which they you can imagine how authority is constituted right through the family through contractual relations through hierarchy so political theorists like like melville because almost every one of his his, his certainly his sea novels have some say something about billy budd and you know and, and benito sereno and and um and and um, obviously moby dick but other ones as well um, I, I, there, I have another, another kind of story which speaks to the sea, maybe not, not exactly in the way that you're suggesting, which I'm gonna, gonna need to think about. But, um, so, on Mo in Moby Dick, um, the most sympathetic character on that ship is Pip, the, the little black cabin boy, and you don't know whether he's there as an indentured servant or a slave, and you don't even know if he's from Connecticut or Albany, but he's described as being from both. And um, there's this incredible scene where he's uh, in a whale boat, and they're chasing a whale, and the whale hits the ship and he falls into the ocean. And I'm, this is, just makes me think about it because I'm try, trying to maybe work around to, to, what, to what you're getting at. Um, and, uh, and he's saved. He's pulled out of the ocean, I can't remember, by Stubb or by Flask, by one of the officers of the... And, and he's, let, he's told, he said, you have to be careful because, w you know, we just lost that whale because of you, and, 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 we're not, and, and, and that, the oil in that whale's body is worth more than you are in an Alabama market, so be careful. So, of course, you know, a second later, he's back in the ocean. He falls back in the ocean, and he's left to drift. And, he, and, and it's, this remarkable, it's this remarkable passage where Melville has him drifting in the ocean, and his ebon head is, you know, bobbing like a clove, and, and, uh, and it's unclear whether he actually goes under the, under the sea, into the water, or if, he's just, if he just fears it, but he, has, he grasps the totality. He, he, he sees God's foot on the loom, he, he, he imagines the beginning of time, and, and, and it's this remarkable moment where, where Pip sees the complete compression of time and space. And, um, and he comes out, and they, he finally is rescued, and he's put back on the ship, and he, and he comes out a little bit mad. He never really recovers. Um, and Melville gives that vision to other people on the ship, Ishmael and others, but they all don't quite grasp the significance. It's only Pip that grasps the significance about the meaninglessness of the universe and the emptiness of the cosmos. And um, it's fairly clear that Melville gets that paragraph, that vision that he attributes to Pip, um, from Darwin. Darwin, is, 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 uh, Darwin is, um, travels across the Andes, 
And as and and in his in, and it's recounted in 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 the book on in the the, the voyage of the beagle, you know, his journeys, his um, um, his um, his journals, and he talks about how he's crossing the Andes and he looks and he looks um, east and uh, he looks across the Pampas, and and uh, and he ha and he re and it's one of it's the most exhilarating moment in the in Darwin's narrative where he he glimpses the beginning of time. He sees the Atlantic lapping at the at the at the base of the Andes, he sees the, the you know the, the, he sees he sees this whole war he sees the world as, as nothing but water, and it's a it's a formative moment in Darwin's thinking about about geology and geological time, and it's fairly and and Melvillians know that Dar that Melville read Darwin, and it's fairly clear nobody's really made this, but this is my reading of it that that Melville gets that takes that paragraph and assigns it to Pip, this little black cabin boy. What's fascinating about it, and this goes back to the other question about the pervasiveness of slavery, is um, Darwin has that vision on exactly the slave, same slave road that Bob O'Mori and the others were forced to climb over. So it's that intertextuality that um, you know. I don't know what to. I don't know what does one make of that. So Darwin has this vision that becomes the foundation of, ge of Darwin's understanding of geo geologic time on a slave road over the Andes um, that, that, and he recount, and he describes that, and that, and that paragraph is then taken by Melville and, and given, and given to, to Pip, the little black cabin boy, um, and, and it's on the same slave road that Bob O'Mori and others were, were force marched over uh, 30, 20 years, 20 something years before, before, um, before. So this, I, I, I don't think I answered your question about the centrality of the sea, but it was, it was, I was just thinking about the enormity of, um, of, uh, of, of Pip seeing the, you know, the sea as a metaphor for the emptiness of the universe. And this, I guess this kind of does circle around to what you're saying, what you're asking is, um, is the sea as a metaphor. And again, the, you know, if, if those Melvillians who want to say that all of Melville's um, grappling with these questions of meaning and emptiness and nothingness and the insignificance of the individual in, in the face of this larger whatever, um, that that has nothing to do with slavery? That seems a little, that seems, I mean, I don't know how, you know, that, that's, that, that it seems to be obviously about slavery, that slavery, that centuries of, that hundreds and hundreds of years of bringing millions and millions of people over, that all of those metaphysical concerns of, of the individual and, and, and meaning in the face of, you know, slavery was the concrete manifestation of that. And, and so I guess the sea as a metaphor for that emptiness certainly is related to slavery, right? The individual lost in the sea and, and what that means and what, and what slavery and the enslavement of individuals in this larger sea. Um, thank you for such a rich uh, lecture and so many, so many things. One thing that picked my imagination is um, you mentioned um, the seal extraction and the, the, uh, the, as the first organized effort to extract beyond the borders of, uh, into international uh, regions and leading to an ecological crisis to the disappearance of these seals in various regions. And, um, and, um, and, and you presented this in the context of also the institution of slavery and the control and domination of a people and the conjunction of these two. Um, um, I'm just wondering if you would like to elaborate a little bit on this issue of extraction and, uh, and, and ecological degradation that, that comes into the picture, I think. Fascinating. Thank you. Oh, elaborate a little bit more on extraction. Well, I mean, it it um it forms a big part of the book, um, the the sealing trade, and it also allows for a, um for it for uh, an almost ethnographic window onto the experience of freedom and slavery because um, you know those the the experience of of of, of sealers on board these islands and 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 their um. And their relationship to the ship crew, ship officers, and the ship—you know—I mean, it was it was something less obviously than freedom. Um, I don't elaborate more on just extraction in general, or. Um, 
<laughs> well, I, I just, again, I, I, I just tried, I was just trying to make the point that um, I just thought that the, taking a Massa Delano as, as, as prototype of this ex extractor um, that was very much involved during this first experience of resource extraction in the South Pacific and, and trying to understand how it intersects with, it, it allowed for a bringing together of these two different ways of, of to, you know, two different studies or two different you know, race violence, but also the moment in which race is, is forged in some ways, right? It is in the violent putting down of this, of this rebel ship that he's able to establish his authority over his largely white crew of escaped Botany Bay convicts, um, escaped, uh, you know, from, not Botany Bay, from Hobart. Hobart. Um, and and in, it's in some ways in, it's, it's the moment in race, race is, is formed and forged in terror, and I, and I just thought I just thought it nicely brings those two things together. I'm not sure if I have anything more to say <laughs> other than extraction. You know, the, this the the importance of sealing and how it represents a certain kind of of um, you know a much more bloody form of of extraction than in some ways that even whaling does and embodies almost settler colonialism. These these sealers established something like the United States' first informal colonies in the South Pacific. I mean, they during the flush years when when things were going well and they were making a lot of money, there was actually a lot of cooperation. These sea captains ruled different islands as if they were you know they set up these ad hoc councils of governing councils in which they administered debt, they signed they signed script. They, um, they ruled over different disputes. There was a lot of actual cooperation among, among sealers during the, when, there was, when there were a lot of seals to kill. And you see in very vivid terms the way that co the cooperation immediately gives, gives way to, to, you know, to rivalry and confrontation, to pitched battles over territory. As, as, you know, so it, it becomes a very, I think, strong, strong metaphor, a strong analogy for other forms of resource extraction and as it relates to imperial power. Fascinating and rich, Greg. I, this last comment picks up something I wanted to raise, uh, at least one half of it. Uh, you could say, given what you just described, uh, that uh, you, you could have played with this theme of American Revolution and its paradox, not in terms of the empire of necessity only, but in terms of the necessity of empire. Because here, after all, is uh, an American captain uh, in far, far from the territorial boundaries of the United States, uh, imposing rule uh, in the name of property, in the name of returning property to its proper yeah, owner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and doing so because he himself is driven uh, by credit and debt and competition uh, to get a piece of the action, at least in part. Yeah. So that's one of the things that occurred to me. But also, what I've been thinking, although I haven't read the novel nor your book yet, is I wonder whether you're looking back too much to the paradox of freedom and slavery coming together uh, in the first 50 years after the American Revolution, first 60, 70 years after the American Revolution, rather than thinking about 1855 and looking forward, uh, it, could it be that Melville is looking to what will emancipation really mean? Yeah, yeah. Is it not a mirage? And will necessity not lead to wage slavery? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you've hardly absolutely. talked yeah, about yeah. that. I think absolutely. I mean, I think he's looking forward, and that's what I was alluding to. I think that's what makes the novel, what makes Benito Sereno so powerful still. I mean, I think there is a sense that there's, there's this, there's this. I don't mean it in terms of race. I mean yeah, it in yeah. terms of wage slavery. Right. in a typical American leftist way, you're focused on race, if I may say. Well, <laughs> I think there is some, I, yes, it is true. I think there is, um, you can only focus on what, I mean, um, you can only focus on certain things at a certain time, but it is true that I, but I think there is, I think there is some explaining to do about the endurance of, of, of why race continues to be so, so intractable. And not just, not just in a general way. I mean, I, we've seen, I mean, not carrying any water for Barack Obama, but you see the, 
you see the reaction and and the rhetoric is just so i mean like the 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 force of the 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 the, the, the um you know the um the politics can't be discussed without reference to the civil war and where, what is that about and why and why is it so in, and why is it so intractable um but yeah but um but I think that certainly, uh, certainly, it could be extended to to uh, to, to wage to wage labor, and, and some of Melville's greatest writings, um, some of his short stories, get at wage labor, or the ref and, and of course the refusal of wage labor. Bartleby the Scrivener is the is the perfect example, but other but other you know other other short stories as well, um, yeah. <laughs> but and certainly the necessity of empire, obviously, yeah. I mean. You know, there's a way in which um, you know that runs throughout the book. The the, the way the and the belief that the move west is going to solve the problem of slavery, but it, it does not only does not solve the problem of slavery, but it obviously extend, extends empire. And thinking about empire as the frontiers of this kind of resource extraction and how it relates to to to, to race violence. But there was something else that I wanted to say. Oh, there's also something else that runs out th through the book. So in the talk, I kind of um, opposed. A Ma Ahab to Amasa Delano as, as these two prototypes saying Amasa Delano would be a more, a more useful way of thinking about the mechanics and, and, uh, and, and laws of, of, of extraction and empire. But obviously they're related um, in all sorts of ways. I mean, I think there's, there's, there's ways in which um, the move from a more self-conscious and violent and wild form of empire represented by Ahab to a more bland form, an administrative bureaucratic form represented by Amasa Delano. There's more of a dialectical relationship between those two and it gets to the, your first comment, the necessity of empire. And, and then maybe one more question, does anyone else? We'll see, then one more after Anne. Oh, well, Anna has hers to come back to. Um, thank you. That was amazing. That's the, what an amazing story. And um, I, so I wondered about the um, free, the, the enslaved and then free and then enslaved again people who are at the center of the story and how much in the documents you've got you can say anything at all about their subjectivity or the way that the story might have looked from their point of view. In particular, I wondered whether the sort of, what looks to me from a very cursory leafing through your book here, <laughs> well, you were, sorry about that. Anyway, <laughs> but what, what looks to me like, it looks to me like there were a series of legal uh, processes that were going on, um, that went on after they were recaptured, and did they have any voice at all? Do you have any of their words, or do you have anything except their actions to tell us about no. their agency? No, their no, and it's an interesting question. I mean, it obviously raises a lot of methodological questions about, 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 um, no, it's all, it's all, through. there's nothing, there's, uh, you know, um, in fact, there's, there's, there's tantalizing hints. They were, um, you know, when, when they were imprisoned in Concepcion, in Talcahuano and in Concepcion, and they sent a confessor in. Um, you know the the. Um, <laughs> no, no, but they. But um, it was funny because there, I found a reference in a in a in a in a catalog that said that um, that there was a document in in Madrid that included the testimony taken, but 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 it wasn't. The, but it it was it was just summarized in a very cursory way. Uh, extremely cursory way, so that didn't exist. And no, it is. There's, there's, and, and Melville confronts this. I think you know that's one of the. Melville includes all of those documents in Benito Cedeno. It's it. It is an experiment in form, not just in the sense that it's told. That story is told through the point of view of Amasa Delano. It's structured where the first third of the book, or two thirds of the book, is through Amasa Delano, and then readers are told about what actually happened through Melville. So Amasa, in, in the historical Amasa Delano's memoir, he includes all of these Spanish documents because he's making his case about why he, why, how badly he was treated by the Spaniards. So he, he, he includes all of those documents in his memoir. Melville just transcribes them and puts them in the story. Um, and he makes, he makes small changes in it. So in some ways it, it's, it is a kind of, um, one could do a reading of, uh, of how Melville is 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 highlighting the impossibility of getting at subjectivity 
you know, that the only way that subjectivity is revealed is through these, you know, the, the, the discursive apparatus of the Spanish Empire. Um, but. <laughs> And also heartbreaking that you can't, oh, oh God, a confession is that amazing. Oh well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. History sucks. <laughs> <laughs> is there one more question before we end? Or we, okay, Patrick. Thank you for a very, very thoughtful lecture, and I've been trying to. It's been percolating through my mind, and I have been flipping through the book too. To, to, and you, you referred to Hegel, and I looked up that passage <laughs> on the phenomenology. And just what would happen if you were to call this instead of the empire of necessity, <laughs> the necessity of freedom? Or why would you not look at the at that problematic, the necessity of freedom? Because in a sense, that's the other side of the story that's so powerful here. So I'm just curious about that sort of flip. The necessity of freedom. The necessity of freedom. To me, that sound that resonates a little bit too closely to the kind of ideal of freedom that Melville would be critiquing, or you know, the, the, I mean, you know, the idea that there is. I mean, the empire of necessity sounds very Hegelian to me. I like. I it sounds very very Germanic. <laughs> I kind of, you know, I kind of, I, I you know, I, uh, um, the, I, I, I'll, why didn't I call it? The, why didn't I call it the necessity of the necessity of freedom? <laughs> I guess I didn't think of it. Is there a structural bias really in, in, in what we're doing that um, suggests really um, that we should be struggling for freedom? That, that, that struggle, in fact, was, was, didn't, didn't really go anywhere. And that so the, 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 white, um, the white freedom, which is constructed on blackness, that you come back to so often, in fact, becomes the dominant freedom. And what we lose then is, in fact, the ongoing struggle for freedom, which I guess is picked up in the class struggle as well. Um, that, that, you see what I'm getting? It's, it's sort of a, a question of emphasis and, and yeah. how one structures the argument. Yeah. Um, I, I think that the weight of the story doesn't lend itself to that. I mean, I think it lends itself to a much more, to a much more, um, you know, it doesn't lend its, I mean, uh, it, it lends itself to a more, um, a more pessimistic read, I think. I don't think it lends itself to the idea, you know, to, and and um, and I and I think part of the problem is the idea of freedom. Is I'm not sure. I have to I have to think more about it. But I, I'm, I was never I'm never big, I'm not big on the freedom on the freedom as an ideal to aspire to, in in, in the way that that word is used. I mean, I, I, well, in the white, the, in the right. white, yeah. In the context of, of white yeah. individuals versus the slave side, you present yeah. that's a problematic notion. Right. Which I would argue with Hegel actually is, is suggesting. Right. Yeah, okay, I'll think. I think he's going to say the last Oh, no, no, thank you. <laughs> no, I was thinking that your um, intervention would be more powerful if it were uh, formulated as the empire of freedom. Well, there's a lot of books. There's a lot of books about the empire of liberty, empire of freedom. I mean. <laughs> I wanted to call the book Who Ain't a Slave, but the, the marketing people wouldn't let me because this was before 12 Years a Slave, they said that it wouldn't sell. Oh. <laughs> so, I, I, side so, your, uh, I side with your um, position, but I think that his criticism would have been more powerful had it been formulated that way. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, now I'm completely <laughs> lost. <laughs> it's late. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we're, we're done here. Thank you all. <laughs> There's surely much more to say. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out. I know it's, it's York, 8 o'clock at night. It's late, and we're <laughs> delighted that you're still here. And thank you so much, Greg, for coming. Thanks, Greg, so much. And, uh, and uh, have a safe trip home, everybody. And we'll see you later. <laughs>